on camera. Good morning. Good morning. It is about 10.30 on Thursday, January 30th, 2020. I'm Sue Verhoff, Director of Oral History and Genealogy here at the Atlanta History Center. Also with me is Taylor Patterson, and Taylor is a member of the Inman Park Neighborhood Association. We are here today to conduct an oral history with Ms. Kathy Bradshaw, who has graciously agreed to be interviewed as part of the Atlanta History Center's partnership with the Inman Park Neighborhood Association. So thank you so much for coming in and doing this, taking the time. So to begin with, um, could you please share with us a little bit about your background and growing up years in Druid Hills? Um, we moved to Atlanta in 1958 when I was in the sixth grade. The first year Fernbank Elementary School opened and my mother was um, a math teacher at Druid Hills and so I went to Fernbank and then Druid Hills and graduated in 1965. And we had moved from um, small towns in Georgia where m our dad was a principal, high school principal, and our mother taught everything. She finally settled on math, which was had been her major at the University of Georgia. My parents were um, um, in graduate school when they met at, at Georgia. And so we traveled around Georgia for all of my early years and then settled in Atlanta. And my dad was the director of textbooks for the State Department. And my mother taught and we were um, not really active in the Druid Hills Civic Association at that time, but after I left home, my mother did get more involved and find out more about what was going on in that neighborhood. And so I knew that neighborhood um, history and activities were important. And I guess when I moved to Inman Park, that carried through, and I um, had no choice but to get involved. Excellent. We're going to take a quick break here. My back on camera. So what I'd like to know is, tell me a little bit about why you chose Brown University and why you chose urban studies as your major. What led you into that? I was at Salem College in undergraduate and all-female college and majored in sociology. And when looking at graduate schools, I thought it would be good, an opportunity to get out of the South. And I applied to Brown and Johns Hopkins and Actually, my dean of women told me that I would never get into Brown, and so that gave me the motivation to um, show her that I could. So I applied and got a, a full scholarship with the NIH and went to Brown for, in sociology, they didn't really have a label of urban studies at the time, um, but that was the specialty I chose. And um, most of the the program was geared more toward um, statistical analysis. So I got a lot of that, which um, also ended up helping not in my career, but in neighborhood work. So I was at Brown in, um, from 69 till 71 and got very involved in the Vietnam War protest movement and became an activist at that point in time. And so Brown was a good um, breeding ground for my future activities in the neighborhood. Excellent, excellent. So you, if I understand correctly, you bought your house in Inman Park in 1971 after graduating from Brown. Correct. There's some really interesting stories about your parents and how you chose and why you chose. Tell us a little bit about that. Why Inman Park and... Inman Park was cheap and uh, I was, when I finished um, at Brown, I had a hard time finding a job because Nixon had announced the wage and price freeze in the spring of 71. And when I applied for jobs in New York and Boston and eventually in Atlanta, I was told that they weren't hiring anybody with a master's, that they only would hire entry level. And I couldn't come in as a secretary because I didn't have typing skills. and. 
my sister had advised me not to put that I was an excellent typer on my resume because then I would get hired as a secretary. So I couldn't then come back and say, but I can type. So I was forced to um, abandon my desire to stay in Boston or Providence or go to New York and um, ended up back in Atlanta. And good friends from college days um, were living in Ansley Park. I rented a house in Ansley Park with and had roommates. And my house was in Ansley was actually for sale for eighty five thousand. But without a permanent job, it was certainly beyond my means to even think about buying a house. But my friends found a house in Inman Park and bought it for five thousand dollars. It had no kitchen, no bathrooms, all the plaster in the walls was damaged and Somehow, by working on their house, they convinced me that I should buy a house. And it was very much at the beginning of the um, movement in Inman Park. And one Sunday afternoon, the house next door to my friends came on the market, and they encouraged me to go look at it. And the slum ward lord was there showing the house and about how it could be divided from four apartments into five apartments and was talking about building a wall down the parquet floor in the dining room. And I just said, no, I'll buy it. You, you can't let somebody come in and, and destroy this house even more. And the down payment was $800. Um, I had four tenants in the house. And because of this law, to you have to give notice, 60 days notice to tenants, um, the rent was um, fifty dollars a week so I got back my my um, down, down payment in the first two months while the tenants were still there and the, I assumed a mortgage from the slumlord and I think it was eighty two dollars and thirty four cents a month and I was able to afford to buy a house even though I didn't have a permanent job and I didn't I had used my money that I was going to buy a, a car with to buy the house so I had to do a little finagling with my dad after he finally got over the shock of my actually buying a house in a slum neighborhood. And um, they did not react well to my buying this house. It was truly a slum house that had um, winos and um, um, it was a weekly rental and it was in horrible condition. And my parents' reaction well, I had gone over to tell them the day that I bought the house that I'd bought a house, and Daddy said, um, using my full name, promise me that you will not rent an apartment in Inman Park while we're out of town. And they were going the next day to visit my sister in Denver, and I said, okay, Daddy, I promise I will not rent an apartment in Inman Park. And I didn't have the courage to tell them that I had actually signed the documents that day to buy a house and called my sister and I said you're going to have to break the news to them and they were close to disowning me. Um, my dad's statement was, one of his many statements was that we have worked all of our lives to keep you from having to live in a neighborhood like that. And of course in, the, in the, that time in Atlanta, Inman Park was a slum and it was it was not a dangerous neighborhood, but it was um, a working class, um, mostly white neighborhood. And the homes, uh, some of the big Victorian homes had been turned into 16 apartments. And so it was, it was a, um, it had declined beyond its days of glory. And that, at that point in Atlanta, to go south of Ponce de Leon was, um, a dangerous thing in many people's minds. The people who had moved away from Inman Park felt that they had moved to better themselves and Inman Park was part of um, the abandoned part of the city that had been left to decay. And so the homes were mostly, I'd say 60 percent were um, not owner occupied, so they they were owned by absentee owners, slumlords, basically, and um, the houses were not ha not having any improvements made to them. So the damage that the tenants was doing was becoming more and more, and um, 
So I ended up with a house that I had no idea what to do with. And I had no skills. My dad was not a handyman, so I, I had a part-time job at Sears. And my favorite department to work in was in the paint and hardware department, because I could ask what I thought then was old men. They were probably in their 50s or 60s. And um, ask them about how to do some of the repairs I needed to do. And the first time I, I asked a question about how to replace a, a socket or a light switch, he asked me if I needed a, a flathead or a Phillips head screwdriver. And I had no idea there was a different kind of screwdriver. And they asked me what kind of, you know, what, what kind of walls I was putting paint on. And I, I didn't know anything different between sheetrock and plaster, and I, I had no idea. So the first paint job I did, I, I evidently put um, a water-based paint over enamel because I, the next day I went in and the, there were, the paint was peeling off. And, you know, so we had a, I had a lot of trial and error um, opportunities during those early days of owning the house. Um, but stepping back, I should probably tell you about one of my, two of the men who were in my apartment that I, um, I had my first encounter as a 23-year-old owning a home as a landlord, that this sort of set my um, history in place. Um, they were named Smokey and Julian, and they were winos and or painted for a living, but drank a lot while they were painting. And um, Smokey had bitten off his tongue when he was in an automobile accident when he was 16. And Smokey, Julian was older and kind of looked after, after Smokey, who couldn't eat regular food. You know, without a tongue you can't chew very well. And I went to the house the first Friday. The slumlord had told me I had to be there before 5 o'clock on Friday or I wouldn't get the rent because they would drink it all away. And I showed up, and they were so proud to meet me. And they said, we've spent all day cleaning our apartment so you could come and see. And I stepped inside, and it smelled like urine, and went into the kitchen, and it was just reeked with odor. It was like there was rotten food in there. And the fellow without the tongue opened the door, and you know he kind of stuttered. And he was so proud to show me the refrigerator and freezer. And there were roaches all over the food. And everything was mashed potatoes and jello and ice cream and uh, mashed potatoes and gravy and it was it was absolutely disgusting and I was just totally naive and had no idea what I was going to do with these two men who I had to have in my life for sixty days, but they taught me a lot a lot of endurance, and you know you kind of get through it um, but as a departing um, gift to me they I went up the, the day they were moving, and um, they asked me if I liked peach brandy. And I don't know that I'd ever had peach brandy, but I said, well, um, sure, you know, thinking they were going to give me a bottle of peach brandy. And they opened up the trunk of their car, and there were two bushels of rotten um, peaches in the back of their trunk. And they said, oh, you can make, you can make some really good peach brandy for yourself. And so, of course, I had to thank them and took them immediately and threw them in, um, across the road, in the road right away. And um, that began my, my career as a, as a landlord. Um, the other three apartments were not as um, colorful people, except that the two women who lived upstairs was a mother and daughter. And between them, they had five children living with them, but they were not the mother of any of the children. Mm -hmm. They had accumulated in them in their previous marriages, and I think they had each been married three or four times, so they had all these children from these other men, none from their own marriages. And the night that I bought the house, I met the women, and they were, they were a little um, quirky, um, but I went back the next day, Some a neighbor called and said, you've got to come back and see this, and one of the women's car had been burned and evidently one of the ex-husbands showed up. They had a fight. She threw him out the second story window, so he burned her car. And so these were the kind of people that were in the neighborhood in Inman Park in um, 1971. 
Um, not dangerous to me at all, but um, you know, they had their own internal problems and difficulties in life. Uh, so I, I took the house and um, with the help of my next door neighbors who had been longtime friends, began to get to know other people in the neighborhood. And because we were all struggling to buy our homes and try to find a place to live within them, we started sharing tools and um, would have Friday night get-togethers and have potlucks. And um, about that time, I think there were maybe 13, 14, 15 people that were actively thinking about, I mean, you know, being involved in a neighborhood. Um, Robert Griggs, um, who was the, our leader, um, and John Sweet were very instrumental in forming the neighborhood organization which I started getting involved in that first summer. And the um, organization at that time was named Inman Park Restoration. And that was the name which was used through the years when we um, began the Inman Park Spring Festival and the tour of homes and um, applying for our um, uh, historic um, district, um, gone blank, the, our um, National Trust designation. And, um, and then at some point, I'm not sure exactly when, but it changed to Inman Park Neighborhood Association because of um, I think because of the tax laws and the 501c3 and because we had been involved in political activities that we needed to make certain that we didn't get in trouble with IRS. And so we, we made a name change. Al Caproni can speak more to that one. But, um, but the, early, the early days, the, early, the first year of Inman Park was just a lot of getting to know the um, neighbors and finding out who had bought homes and we all had to rely on each other a lot for um, um, lifting and cleaning out. And, um, my future husband bought the house across the street from me and he knew a little bit about plumbing and I knew a little bit by that time about patching plaster and uh, so we, we got more involved and his brother lived around the corner so I knew his brother and his girlfriend and some of the neighbors that lived in, in, on Elizabeth Street. And so we just all, you know, had a, had a small community but a very dynamic community of people who, uh, I think when you're taking on a project like restoring a home, you have to get involved in other things as well. And um, one of the first things that we, we did was um, with Holly Mall, who worked for the city of Atlanta at the time, worked for the mayor, um, we realized that we, we needed to change the zoning and um, that the neighborhood through the, in the 60s had been rezoned from residential to commercial and industrial. And if we were going to be able to preserve the homes, we needed to have it zoned residential. So we, we created um, a survey or a, a, a petition, I guess, for people to sign that they would agree to have their home um, rezoned from commercial back to residential. And so that was the first political thing I was involved in with the neighborhood. Uh, the first fun thing was the um, starting the first spring festival, which was in um, April of 1972. And I um, was in charge of refreshments. And since the city hadn't had any spring festivals before, we didn't know what to expect and whether anybody would show up. And we, we were hoping maybe 300 people would come. And we had a, a flea market and people set up a table and sold things. And we had um, a funky little parade with um, not very many people. It wasn't a very long parade but some dressed in Victorian garb and um, we had the, um, a, f um, a fellow, well, I, my brother-in-law, future brother-in-law, rode a unicycle and we had a um, New Orleans band and it was a very fun but low-key event and we had had a tour of homes, um, a few of the homes close on, on Edgewood and um, 
we were expecting about 300 and about 3,000 showed up. And so we were a little overwhelmed, but, but totally enthusiastic. And I borrowed a van and um, another fellow and I went over to Arlen's where the Home Depot on Ponce de Leon now is and um, bought every soda that they had because what we had gotten from Coca-Cola had run out and no way to resupply that. So we bought all the water, sodas, soft drinks, whatever, and um, had enough. It was a hot, hot Sunday day, so we needed some refreshments. And um, the whole purpose of the festival was to try to influence um, politicians and bankers and insurance companies that we were a stable, growing neighborhood. At that point, we were redlined and we were not able to get homeowner's insurance and we were not able to get mortgages. And um, it was even even a, um, a loan to make repairs was hard to get. And so we had had a um, a candlelight tour for the politicians so that they couldn't see all the cracks in the plaster and all. And it was a little bit more appealing with candlelight. And um, had a box lunch, a box dinner under a tent on Euclid um, long before we closed off Euclid. This was just a, a small tent and invited the the leaders of the city to come and, and see what was happening in Inman Park and ended up with a, a party at Robert Griggs and, and Robert Aiken's home on Euclid. And I, I assumed that it had some influence. It took me a long time to get a mortgage. Um, after um, after I met Bo and then we eventually married, um, we moved from my house to his house and the back porch of the house was falling off and we needed a loan to um, tear off the back of the house, expand, add a larger kitchen, family room. And um, I went to 13 banks to try to get a loan and they all said I needed to repair the um, back porch before they would give us a loan. And the whole point of the loan was to tear the porch off because it was not um, it, it was not safe and it made no sense to put money into repairing a damaged porch. And so about that time through that process John Sweet and others had formed the Bond Community Credit Union which um, was uh, all of us pooling our money to create a credit union to make loans available. And it was the first um, community-based credit union in the country. So it, w it took a, a while for John to be able to convince the National Credit Union Association that it was a good idea and that it would be a, a viable um, enterprise. And it's still thriving today and has grown. And from 1972 to 2020, it's uh, um, still a um, a valuable asset in the community. And we were able to get a $30,000 loan from them to add on our kitchen and you know make all the repairs necessary. And then because we had a loan, then we were able to actually get a mortgage a few years later and um, um, start making the other repairs. My husband's house, Bo, had um, bought his house from a woman who had lived in the neighborhood for a long time, so she was one of the elderly women, and she lived in the house with her her brother. And they, in World War II, had had um, uh, had rented out a room to a woman, so that the house had never really been divided into apartments. Um, but our the what is now our office was a bedroom, and then what is now our bedroom was a kitchen. So the house had two kitchens, but the um, Ruth McMillan and her brother and this woman who was their renter shared one bathroom and um, the dining room was a bedroom. So the house had been reconfigured but walls hadn't been removed and um, there wasn't a separate entrance added. So it had not been destroyed. So that house was a lot more manageable than my house which needed a lot of everything plus more. Um, so I sold my house in 78 um, to Sally Dorn and Bill Ferguson and I hope you'll interview Sally Dorn at some point. 
and um, so we moved into into Bo's house, and that's where we live now. And I think he paid fourteen thousand dollars for his house in 1972, and was moving to Atlanta from Augusta, where he was in the army. But since his brother was in Inman Park, he he moved to Inman Park, and um, um, so that was the early days. And I guess Bo came in right before Spring Festival that first year in 72. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me take you back just a little bit. I have a couple questions to okay. ask you about those, those early days. Um, you mentioned that, that the, your tenants, when you first bought the house, had 60 days, correct, to right. get. Did you get any pushback from any of them? Were any of them upset about having to leave? Um, no, a, a weekly renters were, um, they, they weren't long-term renters. I don't think the women upstairs had been there but a few months, and uh, no. The man who lived in the downstairs apartment um, was a traveling mechanic, a, equipment repair, I'm not sure exactly, but he was, he was often um, transitory, and I think that was the um, situation of the neighborhood. No, there was no, no pushback. Were the apartments furnished? Uh, no. Okay. Okay. I don't think so. Um, they did seem to leave furniture, um, and I, I did have a yard sale after they left, and there was enough furniture in it that I made fifty dollars, and um, I used that fifty dollars to buy a crepe myrtle for the front, and that's still living. And so I guess I get I don't know whether the furniture was there when they arrived or not. I'm not, I'm not certain about that. So sixty days have passed, and your renters have left the premises, and you move in. What were you thinking that first night in this home? What was that night? Oh, like? through the whole sixty days, what have I done? Why am I doing this? This is a horrible idea. Oh, it was, it was not good. I owned a single bed from graduate school. I had a single bed, a rocking chair, a stereo, and a bookcase. That was it. I, ha I was not like I was ready to be a homeowner. It was, was a very bad idea. No, the only thing good about it was that the mortgage was $82.34. <laughs> and um, I, I roomed, I um, had an upstairs roommate, a woman that I had um, known, and so she was my upstairs tenant. And then I rented the basement apartment to um, an Emory Law student. and. I charged him $25 a month, and I felt like I was overcharging him because this place was so awful. The, um, the basement had obviously been where, where um, a live-in housekeeper had lived, and not in very um, pleasant circumstances. The bedroom walls were um, the cheapest plywood you could get. They were pan pine paneling. They looked like paneling. But they were abutted. They didn't even have a um, insulation or anything. I mean, it was it was horrid construction. And the first night, um, my tenant came up and he said, "Kathy, there's there's something happening in the basement that I don't understand. But when I turn on the shower, it sounds like a waterfall." So I got my flashlight and we and I got my next door neighbor, and we went down and looked under the house, and the shower was held up attached to the to the house by two walls, but held up by a two by four on the corner, and there was no plumbing. The water was coming in, but there was no drain, so the water was just draining straight to the basement. And it was like another, I mean, that was the first week, and I, I knew nothing about plumbing. What, you know, what am I going to do? So it, it was a series of that kind of events when I, when I first bought this, um, what felt like a monstrosity. And, um, you know, it was only because there were other people in the neighborhood going through similar things. And there were a few couples who had been there uh, um, a year, maybe. Um, Robert Griggs and Robert Aiken had been there since 70, so they already had um, a little bit more experience of how to deal with these problems. 
and I think the that house was 14 apartments. Every room was an apartment. So they had a lot of stories. And um, um, Charles Helms and Helen Helms lived in a, um, a big house that had had a lot of apartments. And so by hearing their stories, it gave me a lot more courage to move forward and to tackle stuff. Um, uh, Bonnie and Jeff Dees lived on Edgewood Avenue in a huge house and they were in the process of renting. They, didn't, they obviously were not complete but they agreed to be on tour of homes and a week before tour Bonnie had a baby. The, the newborn baby is in the living room. I mean these people are, they can survive anything. I could certainly survive um, roaches and um, broken pipes or no pipes and so I, I had, you know, was hearing their stories and I could get courage and, and encouragement from that. Okay. Um, my other big um, shock was the first winter. I bought the house in June and the first winter I had no idea about insulation or, you know, how to, that you should open the valves of your faucet when it freezes. And I came home from work, and um, my bathroom floor was covered with ice. And of course, the downstairs apartment was an, an ice skating rink. All of the water from my bathroom had flowed down and then frozen. And my tenant had left for school, and he didn't tend, he was not at all a tidy um, student tenant. And his clothes were in piles of dirty, dirtier, or dirtiest. And it was mainly just Oxford cloth shirts that he wore to law school. But they were in this frozen pile of water. They were frozen. And um, he was too nervous about the condition of the department to leave the heat on during the day, which was probably a good thing because, you know, everything else was so um, put together so badly. It probably would have burned the place down. But I had all this ice and um, shirts and his living room was covered with um, salting cracker boxes and peanut butter peanut butter that he that tended to be his his meals through law school and um, I, I you know it was just rather overwhelming of how do you deal with frozen water pipe broken pipes no plumbing and fortunately our upstairs tenant had a bathroom that we could use but you know there were just innumerable experiences like that that I kept saying what have I done why am I doing this so what made you stay eighty two dollars and thirty four cents a month <laughs> but by then I had made friends I mean it was a great neighborhood there were even the people who weren't involved in renovating were fun and interesting people and um, there was a lot of variety. There was a lot of diversity. And having majored in sociology, I was interested in diversity. I was interested in different lifestyles. Um, and I also wasn't making a lot of money. So I, I really was, um, I guess, stuck, but stuck in a good way because it, it turned out to be a, a good thing. I did get a good job, and I did end up um, having excess money so we were able to do renovation on the house and we started buying other properties and um, we would go to um, another neighborhood and buy the worst house on the block and fix it up. By that time Bo had gotten out of the army and he had gone, taken advantage of the GI Bill and taken every course that Atlanta Area Tech offered um, and he it's part of his story, but he got out of going to Viet Vietnam by going back to school. And in Augusta, the only school available was either medical school, which he wasn't interested in, or technical school, which he didn't, wasn't really interested in. But to get out of the Army early, he signed up and took a masonry class. And then when he moved to Atlanta, he, it was a good way to stay occupied without actually having to have a job. So. He took all the courses and ended up with a general contracting license. And um, so his skills could be put to use in renovating. And I did all the um, book work and um, paperwork 
and so we um, created a company and I a, after I um, uh, I guess it was when our first child was born in 76 I quit my full-time um, well-paid job and started renovating houses so I could be at home and working. And where was the, the full-time job? Where had you worked? I had worked in um, public relations for Georgia Power and a job I hated. I didn't hate the job but I didn't want to work for that company and it didn't meet with any of my um, beliefs. I think I was one of the few who didn't support Richard Nixon and um, I was more interested in um, alternative energy and trying to um, do more things creatively and it didn't really fit my degree, my interests, so I stayed three years and, and um, moved on. Tell us a little bit about raising children in Inman Park. What was that experience like? Um, I don't, I, since I've never raised children in another neighborhood, I don't have a lot to compare it with. But we, um, we had great neighbors, and uh, Jane was the first of the children in our circle of friends. And so she was almost like an experiment. I hate to say that on camera, but um, we were all learning about how you raise a child, and um, Jane was an independent, interesting um, child. And so she had a lot of adult friends, and it. She went with me where I went. She went to meetings. She. Um, we didn't have enough money to really hire babysitters, so she had no choice. Then she spent time when we were doing um, construction, and you know we just hauled her everywhere, and we thought that was what you did. Um, the stabilizing factor was that my parents were still in Druid Hills and she was with them a lot. And so Bo and I had a lot of freedom because my parents were willing and um, happy to have Jane part of their life. And um, I don't think I could have done any of this <clears throat> without the support team that I had of my parents. And um, <clears throat> I need to swallow. Can I sure. Take a break? Absolutely. Off camera, on camera. Um, and one of the other things that was helpful in the neighborhood, Sally Dorn's name comes up again, was um, uh, she created a, a babysitting co-op. And so we had chits of paper and could um, have a neighbor take care of our child and exchange for the chits, no, no money. And so we got to know other parents in the neighborhood and parents that were, um, had same age child. And so that strengthened our um, um, associations in the neighborhood by having the babysitting co-op. And then the second child came along. It was a little bit more difficult to do the, the swapping, but by then we had established good friendships with um, parents, with couples in the neighborhood who had children our children's ages. And because of the spring festivals, the numbers of people in the neighborhood was increasing. And we um, could see that the numbers were going to grow and that the population was going to continue to change um, to bring in a, a much younger um, group of people and who were interested in you know, similar activities, not necessarily having children, but of those who did have kids um, that we had had a lot in common um, culturally, I guess, not necessarily professionally. We had a, a diverse group of um, people in terms of their career choices, but all had the common interest of the neighborhood. And um, when, um, so the babysitting co-op was very important. and. I think when Jane was six weeks old, um, Bo and I joined a group of neighbors in um, what we call the Gourmet Club. And the other couples had already started this maybe a year before, so we were um, new to the group. And um, so we, st I think it started in 1970, 
three or four, and Jane was born in 76, and, and that group is still going. And so we still get together once a month and have a um, uh, dinner together. The host couple prepares the menu and then gives out assignments. And at first it was all international. And so we ran through all of the, the countries of having international meals once a month. And um, it meant that because most of us had very awful or meager kitchens at the time, it meant we could prepare one dish, go to somebody's house, and have a full nice meal without having to go out and pay for a, a gourmet meal. And um, we were all very forgiving of each other's um, homes. And some were big putting in kitchens. We, were, we started putting in our kitchen in, I think, 79. And so by the time, you know, the, the club kept going, we had a had, um, better environment to cook and eat in. Um, but that was a good stabilizing force also to have friends that um, we were with every month. And then Bo and I were very fortunate that we lived on, um, backed up to what we call the hollow. And it's three acres of open land. And when um, the children started coming, we got to be good friends with um, the families that lived um, um, in the backyard. And it was a safe place to send the kids without having to worry about them being in the street. And um, you mentioned that Taylor is with us today. And Taylor was one of those children that grew up in the backyard. And um, so you could always count on kids being in the back and the adults, um, the parents, to spend time with. And so we all got to be very close and have, in some instances have traveled together. And we still get together every year for um, a New Year, a Christmas brunch with the same families and grown children and now grandchildren. And so the early days of Inman Park really formed a lot of um, relationships that have endured to now. And, and also for our for our children to maintain the friendships of the kids they grew up with. I'm struck by the fact that both of your children have bought homes in Inman Park. I think that's very unique. And I have no idea how that happened. I would never have predicted it because they're both very independent and um, I would have assumed that they um, would have gone somewhere else, but they love the neighborhood as much as we do. And my daughter has now has one child, and my son has two children, and they all went to the Inman Park Cooperative, ten of them, two of them still there. And the co-op, the Inman Park Co-op, is another um, one of our early activities that um, Jane had been in a Mother's Morning program at the Inman Park United Methodist Church the same church where Bo and I were married, actually. And so, 73, we were married at the church, walked to the church to get married. And then in 76, Jane started going to the Mother's Morning Out program. Um, but for various reasons, by 1980, um, we needed a, a new facility, a new organization, and some of the well, I guess all of the parents that were involved in the, um, the uh, preschool or the Mother's Morning Out program um, started up the Inman Park Cooperative Preschool. So it was in the summer of 1981. And um, we took the basement of an old church and in about four weeks painted, cleaned, got it, the rooms organized and started a preschool. And none of us had ever done anything like that before, but we had a need. And um, we wanted the, um, the structure to be um, not a babysitting, um, not a Mother's Morning Out kind mm -hmm. of program, but a more educational, more um, a learning opportunity for the kids. And so teachers were hired, structure was set up, all of the parents being cooperative, all the parents had to work, 
I was the treasurer, and while Ward was there, I certainly worked more hours in my volunteer job than I did having him in school, which I think that any of the parents who were involved at the preschool um, in those early days would say was certainly the case that we um, we worked more in our parent role than our children um, took advantage of the school hours. But once again, it was a very um, stabilizing um, activity and formed longtime friendships through the through the preschool. So and gave our kids a good good start, and I think that that was one of the things that was so valuable to my children was starting at the at the preschool. So I'm hearing kind of a recurring theme here, and that is you saw a need and you met it. Right. And that seems to be um, sort of a, a hallmark of Inman Park. Right. Um, I do want to make sure that we talk a little bit about your activism. Um, I'm fascinated by the fact that you were involved in uh, the anti-war movement up in at Brown and thinking about the connections between that and the things that you participated in to protect and preserve Inman Park. Right. So tell us a little bit about some of those things. Um, I think I mentioned the rezoning and um, like I said I didn't ever actually have a job using my degree but I always found things in the neighborhood that needed to be done that would use things that I had been interested in in college and graduate school. The rezoning was one. Um, um, I guess another early one was during the Inman Park Festival we needed to um, spruce up the neighborhood a little bit so a group of us started um, uh, cleanups and got the city to finally agree to come and actually um, haul our building debris away. And um, as part of that, we, you know, we, we tended to like to turn things into fun. They were work, but fun. We had a goal, but we needed to do it in a fun way. So as part of the cleanup, we had. Um, a competition to see who could create the most interesting, um, uh, what do you call them, scenes in front of their homes with their trash. And, you know, we were still pulling junk out of the basements and fans and heaters and rugs. And so we had people would put out a room, basically, you know, they'd roll out the rotten um, oriental <laughs> rug. and. Um, hang up the um, what looked like a rusted light fixture, but it was actually brass, and maybe a bed, maybe a sofa, chairs, whatever. Some of them broken, some of them okay, and then we would go around and judge the best um, room and, as part of the cleanup. And and of course, we all went shopping. And you know, because they were throwing it away, and that's gosh, that's an Oriental rug. We can take that to Sherian's and have it cleaned, and it's better than no rug on the floor at all. And um, boy, that's a, a brass light fixture that matches my home. I mean, I need that. That's a bungalow style, and our craftsman style. And um, so we found treasures <laughs> in other people's junk, but it also made for a fun way to start. Um, spring Festival. So that was one of the fun things that we did. And um, in order to t entice the city employees to come and clean up on Saturday, um, we got McDonald's and Burger King, I don't remember who else, to donate food. So we, in and we had um, drinks and refreshments and um, dessert and stuff, and a band. And so we got the city work crews to come on a Saturday to do the cleanup, and then we had a neighborhood party, and you know all those guys participated and had a great time. And, and the end result was that we got the neighborhood cleaned up. And for many years we had the neighborhood cleaned up. I don't think we're doing it now because people have um, we're a lot more um, clean and tidy. Though there's always we have a committee that does it now, um, but not as wide-scale neighborhood activity. Um, and my activism, I was on the Zoning Review Board for two years for the city and um, learned a lot through that process of what what the city's approach to rezoning is and some that I had some influence over and some that none at all. 
but through that time I also realized the value of community involvement and um, I was on the board of the credit union for a number of years and um, on the preschool board and then served on the neighborhood board um, as uh, historic preservation vice president and got the ball rolling and started our, our designation for um, the National Trust and others finished that after I rolled off and um, I think I was um, vice president of, of um, well, of, uh, I was treasurer for, for a couple of terms and then vice president of one more, I can't remember what it was, but somewhere in there, but just to be active on the board and to be active in things that came up and and I think that was a lot of what made the neighborhood so successful was that when we saw a problem we did say okay we can do something about it and it is bothersome now when I hear people or I see on next door or on chat lines or whatever is people see a problem but they want to know who to call and who can fix this and um, in my years of being on committees um, when somebody would complain about something or tell me that I ought to do something about this, my reaction was, well, great, I'm glad you're willing to volunteer to take that on. And because it's easy for people to expect somebody else to do the work. And I think the adage is true that 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people. But um, Inman Park had a lot uh, higher number of volunteer involvement than that. and. From that, we, you know, had people who were involved in the politics of the city, getting people elected to office, and um, because of Ruth Wall, I learned that early on, that if you want to affect change, you have a, um, a role in who gets elected. And we, um, through the years of the road fight, I think we elected 57, 58 people to public office, and our criteria at the time was that they had to be supportive of our issue, which was the road through um, the abandoned highway land. And so we elected um, uh, people to city council, county commission in the city of Atlanta and DeKalb County, um, various judges, and um, a lieutenant governor, and even had impact on who was um, appointed to um, uh, the Supreme Court and so wherever there was an office where positions were taken we wanted to have a, a part in that and um, um, also the selection of the um, member to the board Department of Transportation Board um, because they had a lot of influence over what happened in our neighborhood so we we were instrumental in getting somebody up uh, appointed to that board who could be helpful to us and um, and then of course um, our state representative John Lewis who went from City Council to um, the US House of Representatives and he has been a constant um, supporter of Inman Park through the years and that was a valuable friendship at many points and um, so we've you know the political involvement was social because we had wonderful parties and we um, used it as a time to get together but it was also important for electing a people to office. Um, my first campaign was in 1973 um, soon after I got to the neighborhood when the city charter changed from Board of Aldermen to a city council with representative government and um, a mayor and a strong city council. And so we, Candler Park had elected Panky Bradley, and we realized, well, if Candler Park can do it, Inman Park can do it. So we got Charles Helms, who was uh, a local, um, lived, lived on Euclid Avenue, and he was a Presbyterian minister with impeccable credentials, and um, we didn't know a lot about skeletons and, and um past of you know how much the press would delve into the past but we knew that Charles didn't have any any skeletons in his closet so he was a, a good candidate and um, um, I was one of the co-chairs on that 
campaign to elect him to city council. And we were successful and we had a had representation on city council and then every opportunity that came up after that we elected John Sweet and Debbie Starnes from Inman Park to represent us and um, we don't have a representative from our neighborhood at the moment but that doesn't mean we won't in the future and um, so all those political activities were important both for the neighborhood and in the road fight which um, I got involved in that in um, uh, 1980 and um, the just as a, I guess actually it was earlier than that because I remember pushing Jane in a stroller to one of the um, events and um, so she was, Jane became an activist I think because she was involved with um, parents who were activists and grandparents. My parents were very involved in um, social justice and and then eventually got involved in the road fight uh, from Druid Hills. And I um, started taking Jane to rallies and meetings. And then as I got more involved, then I, you know, she wasn't with me as, as much at those activities. But um, for the um, years before I became president of, of Caution, I was involved in things like the phone bank where we had a um, the way to involve people was that if somebody got an announcement about a meeting or a court hearing or an activity um, one person would call two that those two would call two and you know we didn't have cell phones we didn't have computers we didn't have fax machines we didn't have any of the modern equipment that would make life so much easier and certainly no cell phones. We didn't even have telephones that uh, weren't attached to a cord um, which is hard to believe that that much has changed in my lifetime but um, we somehow were able to run the activities of a very diverse organization with a phone tree and uh, of course some people were professional and had real offices and actually had access to more equipment and were being the neighborhood that we were joined with Candler Park, Druid Hills, Lake Clare, Ponzi Islands. We all shared that diverse um, resource bank of talents and um, abilities and never knew that we couldn't take on City Hall um, in that instance we were taking on an ex-governor, um, Mayor Andy Young, who was a, um, a former Jimmy, Jimmy Carter um, appointee, and all of the press and the business community. And we, we never, never knew that we couldn't carry on a fight because we knew that we were right. We knew that putting in a 12-lane expressway through our neighborhoods was a bad idea and we knew that the only way to stop it was to become involved and um, through the years I think we in the first real rally we had when DOT had a, um, uh, a meeting about the environmental impact statement for people to come and express their opinions and to um, be recorded and sign up to actually have input um, we had over 3,000 people show up and it's hard for me to think today that we could actually get people to come out for, you know, a small meeting and to show that much passion. But we had, um, it, we were fighting for our homes. We were fighting for our neighborhood and um, we were able to join with the other neighborhoods and we didn't, one of our goals in the early days was we're not going to um, betray any of the other neighborhoods. You know, it might have been easy for Druid Hills to say, okay, well, you build the expressway through Inman Park, but don't come to me. <clears throat> but we um, decided early on that we were going to make this a no road. That was going to be our mantra, keep it simple. We were not going to compromise, and we were going to fight to the end. And it took 10 years, and it took, I haven't added up the number of lawsuits I've asked 
developer um, to do that. But we had we had lawsuits at the city, the county, the um, superior court, state court, even went to the Supreme Court of Georgia, and you know the the lawsuits were any time a lawsuit could be filed, we found a reason to file it, and we would raise the money to make it happen. We had a team of volunteer lawyers that worked diligently in addition to their own jobs. They worked many hours as volunteers. And we had a lot of volunteers just helping them do research, doing whatever was needed to make it happen. And um, we had rallies. We had a team of artists and painters and sign makers and costume builders and puppet makers and um, musicians and public relations and you know whatever the need was somebody could be found to fill the gap of what was needed to um, for that particular incident and um, so when um, when I became president we were at a point where um, things were a little discouraging and we had had lost a few battles but it was just a time to gear up and make the neighborhoods um, pull together and raise more money and win the battle. <laughs> and we were just, we were fortunate that we had Judge Seliger in DeKalb County Superior Court who um, ruled in our favor on a, a big decision that um, DOT could not condemn city parks and that was sort of the breaking point where um, we knew that we were finally had some legal backing and some ground that we were um, we could build on and we were able to save the Olmstead parks on Ponce de Leon and by that time the Olmstead linear parks were an important part of the road fight where um, national publicity had been gained and um, and the road could also not go, th go through Candler Park because the city park had been designated as a park in perpetuity so DOT could not um, just condemn the land and build the road through there so we had um, we had reached the point where um, we we saw that success could be ours. We had elected the 57, 58 people to public office. Um, we had a rally at the um, at the court, at the state capitol and um, uh, invited all of the elected officials to come and Governor Miller was the, um, Zell Miller was the governor at that time and we presented him a um, proclamation that the time had come to resolve the issue of um, of the highway um, and I think that the dynamics of the Olympics coming and the fact that they were not winning as many um, lawsuits as, as they had hoped um, and we had shut down a few other um, activities that they had tried to pull in the Georgia General Assembly and um, we the last point was that we had court ordered mediation from Judge Seeliger between DOT caution and um, the city of Atlanta so we entered into 54 hours of mediation and came up with a settlement that DOT the city and the neighborhoods could sign off on and ended up with um, Freedom Park and Freedom Parkway, which was more like a, a parkway than the 12-lane expressway that had originally been planned. It was originally a toll road, but became an expressway. Let me ask you this. You, you touched on this briefly just a few minutes ago when you commented on the fact that today, um, you know, people want to know who to call to fix it. You've seen a lot of changes in Inman Park in 49 years. Right. How has that changed, or has it, that, um, that willingness to see a problem and fix it that we've been talking about? Well, we still have a great group of people who's interested in doing that, but um, because we're bigger, um, and I think that there's, um, well, we have a great newsletter, we have 
community meetings we have, but with the number of people, um, it's hard to get information out. And I think people don't know um, the history. They don't haven't been involved, and um, so they don't have the background to know how to get things done. And so it's a fair question to say who can do this, but. Um, um, a lot of those people I don't think would take it on themselves because they don't know that that structure is out there to support them. And um, I think the my biggest um, issues with how big neighbor the neighborhood's gotten is that I don't know everybody. Um, you know, through the years I I knew most of the people in the neighborhood, and we had um, Friday night potlucks on a very informal basis, which has now grown into a porch party, which we have every the last Friday of every month. And, um, you know, in those original days, I would I knew everybody. Um, but as we've grown and have gotten bigger, it's really hard to, to know the, um, I know my immediate neighbors, but it's hard to know the people in the surrounding areas. And um, as the projects have um, have developed with gates on them that it's not, you know, they're not as accessible. And so it's important to be involved in things like um, the festival on a committee and to do things. It's important to go to the neighborhood meetings. It's important to do all those things because that's where you learn and meet people and learn what's going on. And the more, and I've always told people that when they move in and when I meet them, that the more they get involved in the neighborhood, the more they're going to love it. And the more they contribute to the neighborhood, the better the neighborhood will be. And when we get resistance about people not wanting to be on tour of homes or not wanting to volunteer because they have friends coming and they have their own parties to do, it's, well, you know, it takes about 900 people to pull off festival. And if everybody in the neighborhood put in two hours, it's not a burden. Uh, we have a fabulous committee structure where people know their jobs, they train people. It's, it's a well-run machine at this point. A lot of work involved, but it's still well-run. And um, the more people volunteer, I think the more fun they have living in the neighborhood and the better the neighborhood is because we then have resources for more people to do more things and we can accomplish more and keep making it better. Um, I think that's, my daughter is now um, festival co-chair after having, you know, grown up in the neighborhood and gotten involved. And the other co-chair was also born in the neighborhood, Samantha Bailey. And to have these two young women who are co-chairs and then people like Taylor who are very involved in things in the neighborhood now, that this next generation is coming up. And that's been one of the wonderful things is seeing that it's not just those of us who've been here a long time, but the new, the new generation, the young, the next generation, and even the grandchildren are getting involved. And one of the funny stories about the grandchildren is that my daughter is very involved, and she's an activist. My son, not so much. So his his children have not been involved in um, organizing as much. And um, one day, Jane had some flyers to pass out to invite neighbors to a political party at her home. And so I told the kids, okay, kids, come on, we're going to go pass out flyers. And my four-year-old grandson went to my dining room table, picked up my vase of flowers, and he said, do I get to take these to Zoria? <laughs> and there's a little girl who lives next door to me. And the Jane's son, who was a little over two at the time, he went and grabbed the flyers. He knew the difference between flyers and flowers. So the kids are getting involved, but in their own way. <laughs> if you had to choose um, sort of an overarching singular accomplishment um, that you have done in, your in all of your associations with Inman Park, what would kind of be the, the standout? Um, seeing the road fight, fight through through the through mediation, and um, going to more meetings than I could possibly count, um, but the reward was there that in the end we prevailed, 
and um, it, I think it has had a long-lasting impact on the neighborhood that, um, that the effort was worth it. And I think my children probably suffered a lot through that time, and they, they didn't have um, as much attention as I could have devoted to them. But for me, it developed a lifelong friendship with people not just in Inman Park, but um, Candler Park, Lake Clare, mm -hmm. Druid Hills. And um, it was, yeah, I think that was the, the biggest, that I gained as much from it as I gave back to the neighborhood. Well, I would argue that your example that you have set for your children is priceless, and <laughs> they can't get that any other way. So I'm to learn the difference between flyers so and flowers. No, I love that. <laughs> Just take a quick look here. I think that we have covered most. I didn't give the background of how I got into the road fight and what all that meant. I kind of assumed that people knew what the road fight well, was. Well, tell us about it. Tell maybe us I about should it. just clarify mm -hmm. that a little bit. I realized I jumped to mediation. Um, but in the, um, the 1960s, the Georgia Department of Transportation had planned on building a, an expressway from Atlanta to Athens called the Stone Mountain Freeway. And when I was growing up in Druid Hills, um, my junior year in high school, my parents received a letter from DOT that um, there would be this road going down Ponce de Leon and that um, their house would be affected in that a 12-foot chain, 12 foot high chain link fence would be outside um, our bedroom windows and that the first two houses on the street would be um, torn down to make room for an access road on the south side of the freeway. And at that point in time, I think it was 1964, my parents had no idea that you could fight um, DOT. And so they, they didn't do anything about it as far as I know. I went off to college and came back and um, Jimmy Carter had been elected president and you know after his term was up he came back to Atlanta and the road that had been um, designated for the freeway was now abandoned. Ironically Carter was the one who stopped the freeway in I think 72 uh, maybe when he was governor and um, it was before then. When he was governor, a Blue Ribbon Commission had recommended against the freeway and all that. Um, but when he came back after serving as president, he needed a place to put his library. And the way the, the laws were written, that any road that land that had been cleared with federal funds could be used for another use but there had to be a designated um, highway as part of the project. So Carter could get the land where an interchange had been previously planned for the connection of I-485, which was the north-south road going through Morningside, Virginia Highlands and on up to 400 in North Atlanta, and then the Stone Mountain Freeway. So there was a big interchange planned where the Carter Center now is. It was a big cloverleaf. And um, as long as he had a road component, he could put his library and the Carter Center on that land and pay a small sum for the Carter Center part of it. And um, so that was the, the reason that the, the um, uh, Presidential Parkway was created. Andy Young was president. He was happy to do something to make um, President Carter happy. And Andy Young and his entourage came to Inman Park to present the plan. And he was astounded that we weren't just overwhelmed and thrilled because they were going to put in tot lots right next to this parkway. And we're going, you're going to put a playground right next to where kids are going to be playing. I mean, cars are speeding by, and it, at that time it was a full-blown expressway 
with high speed and tractor trailers and um, five bridges over city streets and to us it looked just like the expressway it was and that's why we called it the X Prez way and after President Carter and we were in the I naively was under the assumption in the early days that President Carter who was out working for peace and justice and you know preaching basically peace and collaboration and um, work with your neighbors and you know we can have world peace but he I just naively thought that he at some point would come and work with his neighbors and yet he shunned us and never made an effort to um, make peace with us even though we thought we had valid grounds and that we weren't fighting the library the library could exist but we wanted the road to be scaled down and only to go around the library and not to impact the neighborhoods and um, it was really astounding to us that he would not willingly or actively participate in trying to resolve things and so we ended up in a full-blown battle so to speak mm. and um, it, it became personal at that point that he was seemed to be putting something in that was going to be detrimental to the community and um, um, I got in as I said earlier I did get involved just in rallies and committee work and um, somehow because of my background I um, ended up getting pulled into it more and more and I think all of it went back to that letter that my dad got in 64 that it was going to be so destructive and I, I could see you know a lot of people didn't understand what oh you know build a road it's just a road but when it's going to be right next to your bedroom you're you know I think my um, understanding of it was a little bit better and also because of my um, uh, not training but um, education I think I understood it a little bit more and was willing to participate and because we had such a good team of lawyers and um, other activists that it was an easy role for me to slip into always kind of makes me think of it's a wonderful life the yeah. building and loan in the town you know and the community based and you know well, we've I, got a great neighborhood you and do a lot of people want to want to live in our neighborhood and I think that's a uh, tribute to all of us who've um, worked hard to make it a good place to live. It absolutely is. Yeah. Is there anything we haven't covered that feels important to you? Um, probably the other thing is our trees. Yes. And um, early on, the trees of Inman Park were, it was obvious that they were aging. And um, I did participate on the, the tree watch and the tree committee and that has evolved into a great great um, group of people working with Trees Atlanta which was in its formative years um, and also getting started so you know we were able to team up with Trees Atlanta early on but in the early days we just you know had neighbors go out and prune and um, clean up the trees and one of the incidents that I was specifically involved in was that the where the Little Five Points Community Center now is um, was an elementary school and there was a um, a live oak in the yard of the school that was absolutely fabulous and had a big drape, drooping branch that touched the ground and um, Cumberland Island has been a part of my um, passion through the years and we we spent a week or two at um, Cumberland every summer and so I loved the live oaks and the city um, Atlanta Public School crew came in one day and cut the tree down and it was probably a hundred year old tree and the branches that were the one that was drooping to the ground was probably 24 inches in diameter I mean it was just an absolute wonderful but it had a perfect little sway in it for kids to sit and you know hang out at school and they cut the tree down because they said it was unsafe for the kids that tree was not unsafe for the kids and it just infuriated me so 
I went to um, a Greens, and I can't remember the other. There was another large um, uh, landscape company in Atlanta, and I called and many, many different companies that sold trees and finally found one that had, had had bought two live oak trees for a client that didn't want them. And so I bought the live oak, it was probably a, um, a 12 feet tall maybe, and we planted it near where that the destroyed tree had been. And um, it's still growing, it's getting big, it doesn't have any big drooping branches yet, but um, I, I am a bit proud of that tree that we were able to replace it. And I think that, you know, gave me motivation to get more involved with the tree work in Inman Park. That, that happened before Jane started school, um, so it must have been 74, 75, so that tree has been growing. Um, since 1974, mm -hmm. and it just shows that trees do, um, they will get big in your lifetime. Some people are afraid to plant trees, um, like Taylor's parents planted a white oak and they were advised not to because it would be so slow growing. And that tree is just fabulous now. It is just wonderful. My next door neighbor also planted a white oak and, um, well, we planted one in her, her memory, her mm -hmm. honor, and that tree is, is it's huge, and so they may be slow growing, but I'd hate to see what how big it would be if they if it were a fast growing tree, because the one in your yard is just fabulous. So the trees are the trees are very important to Inman Park. And I noticed a few years ago you were honored with a tree planting ceremony oh, at Inman Park. So yes. I think those efforts have certainly been For recognized. Seventieth birthday, and oh. they planted seventy trees. So that's yeah. so that was good. Yeah, that was wonderful. Taylor, can you think of anything that you'd like to ask? I just wanted to, with your uh, educational background in urban planning, what has it been like to see the, the commercial development on North Highland, that Inman Quarter sort of district? Mm -hmm. Did you ever sort of envision that happening or? Um, no, not, not, you know, we didn't have, I didn't have the anticipation that there would be ever the kind of money or draw um, to Inman Park, so I, I no. Um, I, I of course looked at that the old industrial yard more from um, the point of renovating it and um, doing um, um, a creative, adaptive reuse. Like Bo and I bought the building that the Highland Bakery is in, and have turned it into well, originally to artist studios and to um, put a bakery back in it, which the building had originally been built for in the 30s. And um, so I'm more um, interested in adaptive reuse. And so the new structures are a stretch for me. I do understand and I appreciate the fact that in order to have the wonderful restaurants and shops that we have, you have to have density. So I've never opposed the density, but I have, um, uh, my design would have been different. And I do have problems now with our city planning department. We've never really had much planning from the city. We used to have a wonderful planning staff on the city, but um, through the years it seems that developers do more of, have more influence over what the plan, planning mm -hmm. is. And um, we have a current situation where using a two-way street, putting in two new buildings with a lot of um, employees and visitors and no plans for rapid transit, no bus stop, no yeah. pullover for Uber or deliveries, no handicap parking. And so I have a, from my planning perspective, I have real issues with that, but that has not prevailed with the city. So, you know, we, we will always be having battles. and. Um, some we lose, some we win, and you know we just keep persevering. But it has changed the dynamic of the neighborhood. But um, I, you know, I, most of it, is, most of it is good. Some of it I'm not so happy about. But you know, I think that's part of the dynamic of a growing city. The Beltline is wonderful, and that's yeah. been great. But um, 
that again never anticipated the amount mm -hmm. of influence it would have over development and that the um, focus has been on much larger development with a lot, not many controls that I think has been um, to its detriment. And um, I, I would like to have seen more diverse housing um, mm -hmm. put along the Beltline. And maybe that will come in the future. But. Well, this has just been a delight and a pleasure. I can't tell you how much I've learned. I'm so impressed with all that you've done. Um, I think, to a large degree, Inman Park owes its survival to your efforts. Inman Park wouldn't be Inman Park had it not been for the successes that you had with Caution and um, with the, the activism that you have promoted and sponsored and fostered. Well, and you have to remember that this was a group of people. Of course. And I was one of a group. And, um, you know, we've, I've seen some obituaries written by people who were involved in the road fight, and they say that they won, you know, saved, the, and I go, whoa, there were 3,000 of us. You know, there were 4,000 of us. There were a lot of us out there. And, um, and I, I stress that, that it was only because of the diversity of the in-town neighborhoods and the willingness of a lot of people. And I just latched on. and and rolled with it, and, but there are many, many names that come up that need recognition during the whole, all of Inman Park's history. And, uh, and I think that's important to remember that it, oh. it took a group. Absolutely, absolutely. But thank you for all of your efforts, your efforts to organize and the unique personality that you have that has drawn people to the effort. Well, thank so, you. It's thank been you. fun. Like I said, we like to turn things into a into fun as well as work. So awesome. That's always important. Well, thank you so much for coming today. We appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks. Okay.